Well, good afternoon, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you who are joining us virtually today. This is our second time that we've had to do a virtual uh, data release. I am Jan Reimer, the Executive Director of the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters, uh, joining you here from Treaty 6 Territory, Métis Region 4. Uh, we have members joining us from across the province, from all treaty areas and Métis regions that comprise the province of Alberta. ACWS itself represents some 40 different sheltering organizations, and they in turn operate over 50 emergency and second stage and senior shelters for those serving women, children, and seniors fleeing violence and abuse from across this province. We've been doing this since 1983, and we do it to amplify the collective voice of domestic violence shelters in Alberta. The annual uh, data release is our yearly update to the community, and today I will be sharing with you some of the important learnings that we've had from the data that was collected over the past fiscal year, which covers the time frame between April 1st, 2020 and March 31st, 2021. Like the communities that they operate in, shelters throughout the province are unique. The annual data release provides a provincial summary highlighting overall trends. While there are variances between communities, as well as differences in experiences of urban and rural shelters, there is nonetheless an all too common truth that women in all areas of our province are experiencing violence and shelters, no matter what the challenges, are responding to support them. There's a whole spectrum of services that shelters offer, whether they serve people through emergency sheltering, outreach services, second stage residential services for women who are rebuilding their lives. Shelter services take many different forms, but at their very core, they are providing a woman-centered and trauma-informed response for survivors of domestic violence who are at many different stages in their journeys. Shelters offer a unique frontline perspective, and what they are telling us is that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has affected their operations in many critical ways, such as increased staff turnover, challenges in isolation requirements, particularly in a communal living environment, reduced shelter capacity due to public health restrictions, and financial shortfalls caused by a loss of fundraised dollars. The inability to engage in their usual fundraising activities over COVID has been a critical blow to shelters, as on average, they rely on public fundraising for a fifth of their budgets. Not all the beds in shelters are government funded, and shelters have had to become veritable acrobats in their creativity to find ways to fill the gaps and help as many women as possible. What we are seeing is that shelters have to do more and more with less and less. Shelters are having to fill service gaps in a whole variety of areas, health care, housing, legal supports, and much, much more. This is especially true for shelters in smaller towns in rural areas where they may be one of the few resources, and I think at times the only resource open during COVID. To speak to the importance of wraparound supports for women in shelter, I'd now like to invite Kathy Collins, the Executive Director of Wings of Providence, to say a few stories about some of the, few words about some of the experiences that they've been having. Thank you, Jan. Many of the residents who arrive at Wings after fleeing a life plagued with violence have lived in an isolated environment where they have been unable to make community connections to tend to their needs and those of their children. One critical area that often goes unchecked and neglected is their healthcare needs. At Wings, we have a nurse practitioner on staff who's able to assess their complex family and individual healthcare needs. Within an expanded scope, she may order and interpret lab and diagnostic tests, make referrals to specialists, connect residents to local community resources such as family doctors, public health, physiotherapy, physiotherapists and pharmacists. 
She teaches clients about their health and the health of their children within a trauma-informed framework. During time when clients may be isolated and disconnected from their family physician, the nurse practitioner is able to serve as a short-term healthcare provider for a seamless transition as clients move back into the community. Often call, clients can fall ill and need medical intervention and assessment. This is of such great importance as in emergency situations, a medical assessment is timely and integrated with the team at WINGS. This allows social workers to work quickly to ensure the children are cared for if their mom needs to visit the hospital. Clients feel comfortable with the nurse practitioner as she establishes a rapport and she is a consistent healthcare provider in their lives. They do not have to tell their stories over and over again to different providers. This is very important. One resident described the importance of on-site healthcare in this way. She described the nurse as not just looking at the medical side. She gives thought to your individual circumstances and she has a genuine interest. She really listens and helps me solve the problem. She looks at the whole person. It is so refreshing. Without asking, she makes you comfortable, comfortable enough to share your concerns. And from there, I have been able to get the health care that my children and I need. This on-site nurse practitioner support has been invaluable during the pandemic. From getting our clients in for COVID testing, providing invaluable information on vaccinations and helping them book appointments, her knowledge and credibility have been enormously beneficial to our program. Ultimately, establishing proactive healthcare practices for our residents and their children sets them up for a healthier future when they transition into the community. And I'd just like to thank the donors and the community who help us through some of our fundraising efforts to ensure that this nurse practitioner can be on site and provide this services to our families. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And I think it certainly gives that important perspective of uh, you know, proactive health care and how shelters really try to care for the whole person in how they're doing their job and working to support women and children. And shelters all across the province do this kind of care work on an incredible scale. Over the last fiscal year, 6,233 women, children, and seniors were sheltered at our member shelters. Another 8,095 were served through outreach programs. And over there were 13,605 turnaways recorded for women and seniors requesting admission to shelter. These unfulfilled requests also identified that they had 5,300 children who had, would have accompanied their mother into shelter had they been admitted. Turnaways themselves can happen for a number of reasons. One, the shelter simply doesn't have the space. Secondly, the shelter does have the space, but it's not available due to public health restrictions and requirements that we've seen during the pandemic. Or finally, the shelter is unable to provide the services requested or needed by the caller. An example of that might be housing, mental health supports, and addiction. But all told, 66,687 Albertans were served through residential stays, outreach, or calls to shelter. As a sidebar, there were some interesting co correlations on how overall calls to shelter went down as COVID cases went up. And uh, for each wave, the number, as the number of cases increased, the calls and admissions went down. This really speaks to the importance of public messaging and how stay home, stay safe played out for women in abusive situations. Many who remain trapped at home with abusers who used the pandemic restrictions as another way to isolate and used to their advantage. Admissions to emergency shelters that have been lower during pandemic times. However, admissions have risen in second stage shelters over what we saw in 2019, 2020. Even though we see fluctuations in the number of calls and admissions, it does not mean that domestic violence rates have decreased. Sadly, municipal police departments and the RCMP are reporting that domestic violence calls have either increased 
are held steady, including, tragically, 50 domestic homicides reported by the RCMP in 2021. To underscore this point, an alarming 58% of women who enter shelters are at severe or extreme risk of being killed by their current or former partner. The danger assessment, or DA as we call it, is a tool developed by Dr. Jacqueline Campbell and has been used by shelters in Alberta for almost two decades. It measures the women's risks of being killed by a current or former partner. Of the 1,155 women who completed the DA this year, 29% of them had been threatened with a lethal weapon or had a lethal weapon used against them. That means that based on our data, and remember that women coming to shelter are the tip of the iceberg of women who are experiencing domestic violence. So those women who had contacted the shelter had also completed the data, the, the DA. For those women alone, almost a woman a day has been threatened with a lethal weapon or had a lethal weapon used against her by a current or former partner. Let that sink in. Domestic violence is not just one woman's problem, it's everyone's problem. It affects ripples outwards across communities and it has a deeply harmful impact on everyone it touches. Children are especially impacted by domestic violence and they constitute close to half of the admissions to shelters across our province. It is interesting to note that over the last two years, the proportion of women with children increased in second stage shelters and decreased in emergency shelters. This may reflect a preference for self-contained units offered by second stage shelters over the communal living environments uh, offered by emergency shelters during a pandemic. The pandemic has taught us that self-contained apartment style units known as second stage shelters are more pandemic proof. And this is reflected by the increase in admissions at second stage and a decrease in emergency. Women have been telling us for many years that communal living environments are not conducive to their own healing. The many challenges of communal living include a lack of space and privacy, hygiene, shared bathrooms, even prior to the pandemic, and second stage offers a vital balance of that enhanced safety that women need and the independence for the women who stay in them. The demand for outreach services also grew during the pandemic, demonstrating the need for services such as safety planning, general counseling and support, and assistance in finding affordable housing after you leave, all of which can be accessed without the woman necessarily residing at the shelter. You don't need to stay in a shelter to get help from one. I'd now like to invite Natasha Carvello, Executive Director of the Medicine Health Women's Shelter Society, to share a story of one survivor of domestic violence whom they were able to help through outreach services. And Natasha. Thank you, Jen. Um, Dorothy is an 83-year-old woman who started accessing outreach services after her husband of 60 years was finally charged with assaulting her. Dorothy had been hiding the abuse for the entire 60 years of the marriage. Lately, his abuse had become more violent and less easily concealed. The night he was arrested, Dorothy's husband had been repeatedly beating her in the head and had told her he was not going to stop. Dorothy finally was able to scream out for help and neighbors called the police, thankfully. Initially, Dorothy was thrilled to be away from her husband and living a life where she could come and go as she pleased and live without fear. But despite the no contact order, Dorothy's husband started coming around again. With typical abuser characteristics, he once again convinced Dorothy to take his side, turn her back on their family and feel sorry for him. With weekly sessions with our outreach program staff, Dorothy has been able to take her power back. She is thrilled to finally feel safe and even more excited to be able to finally make her own decisions in her life. She can see things for how they are now. Dorothy is enjoying this phase of her life on her own terms, doing whatever activities she chooses to do, when she chooses, and with whom, and she gets to feel safe 
all the while. Feeling safe was the most important thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Natasha. It also reminds us, too, that uh, abuse takes many forms and doesn't matter what your age. As we look to build back better, we imagine the shelter of the future, and it's time to consider how shelters are designed. Shelters across our province are aging with declining infrastructure. Some cannot even accommodate people with ac accessibility needs. Some have leaking roof unreliable plumbing, and some of the other common issues related to aging buildings. Shelters need support now more than ever. They continue to deliver services through what we call the new normal, two years into an ongoing public health crisis. Although many aspects of the pandemic have become normalized, the added resources needed to operate a shelter during a pandemic haven't lessened and will become even more challenging as they weather the impacts of climate change in the future, as our sisters in BC are now seeing. Since the pandemic began in 2020, it has affected the operations of shelters across the province, indeed across the country, in critical ways. This compounding of pressures has added significant stress on shelters. Shelters give to their community in so many different ways, and they need the support of their communities now more than ever. So if possible, donate to your local shelter. You can find an ACWS member shelter in your community by visiting our website, Shelter. We want the public to know that shelters remain open and that they can provide help in person or over the phone. Some remain the safest place for women fleeing violence. They can help women ac assess their danger levels and create safety plans. They can connect them with the resources they need. And you can connect with the shelter nearest you by calling our 24-hour hotline at 1-866-331-3933. For all of those of you who may be listening, learn about the types of abuse and let others know about available supports. Not all abuse is physical, and understanding the different types of abuse can help you recognize it in the people you know. Indeed, everybody knows somebody. They may, may just not know it. If you have concerns about someone's situation at home, let them know that support is available to them in person or in full from their local women's shelter. Thank you very much for being here with us today, virtually, and we'd, ha we'd be happy to take any questions. Question for Ben. How do six years of turnaway numbers compare to previous years in your perspective? Uh, the turnaway numbers have been generally down. Over pre-pandemic, we were seeing a, st a real increase, and that fell um, during uh, the pandemic. And uh, it's now increasing again as there's gaining more and more activity, but they're not at levels that we've seen, you know, say five years ago. Is there a wait list to get into shelters? How long is it? Uh, no, shelters don't keep wait lists. They encourage you to call and ask. Second stage may keep a wait list, and depending on the availability of their apartments, uh, bring women in. Uh, but just, we just really encourage people to call and to get the support that they need, and shelters will help you try to figure out how that could best work. Can you talk about how social distancing, et cetera, has impacted the shelters and how, how many they can support, how many people they can support, I believe is the question. Yeah, well, I think uh, certainly that, as I said earlier, that message of stay home, stay safe, we have that social distancing, that physical distancing, we know that isolation is a very common tool and tactic used by perpetrators of violence and those who have abusive personalities. So this played right into their hands. Um, it's so hard to know um, and, and really estimate the numbers, but we do know anecdotally of stories of women, you know, crouching in their closet trying to use their cell phone to contact shelters or their lawyer, going out for a walk. Um, trying to figure out a time when it might be available. All those are the different things that women have tried uh, that we're aware of uh, during the pandemic to try to reach out for help. 
But as I also said earlier, it was really interesting to note how the more that there was that messaging of stay home, stay safe, that women became fearful of their health and that of their children, they were less likely to reach out for support. But as things relaxed, then we again saw those increases in demands both for support, calls, and outreach. Jen, would you be able to talk more about the infrastructure needs of the existing shelters, the leaks, et cetera? Yes, I think we've, we've really seen that. I mean, one of the things that to be a shelter director, you have to not only understand uh, trauma and counseling and support and budgets, you need to know how to unplug that toilet and deal with overflowing you know, drains. Um, and I think what we've seen is, uh, what, what, and we've seen a great general replenishment starting lately with um, uh, new shelters, but many of them are getting old. Uh, they were built in the 80s and 90s. Um, there isn't really a lot of money ever given uh, to shelters for ongoing maintenance, and there certainly needs to be uh, better investment in that. Um, it's also an opportunity, I think, to really think about what is it that women shelters really need going forward. What should they look like? Uh, when shelters started, it was often, you know, a woman uh, opening up her doors for her own home uh, to let other women in. And so we've kept that residential model of housing. But maybe there are other models. I think we've seen that with Second Stage and having those self-contained apartments while still allowing for groups and mutual support and aid, but at the same time having just a basic space where women even can be by themselves. You know, shelters are, you know, a communal living environment for emergency. So sometimes it's even hard to find a place to cry because you're there with your children. Uh, so really uh, rethinking how shelters are designed, how they can provide that support in the community, and how you can deal with accessibility issues as well, I think are really important, and they are all things that shelters are experiencing. Add to that, like what we've been learning both from the Fort McMurray um, wildfires, the floods in Calgary, et cetera, are also the importance of preparing for climate change. And what does that look like if your power shut down, if you don't have a generator? How do you evacuate women? What are the abilities of that? So as we look at designing shelters in the future, I think all those different considerations need to be taken into account. Jen, what's the biggest thing you want viewers at home to take away from this latest data? I think it, it certainly is that if you need help, go and get it. It's really important. I guess that maybe I'll have to squeeze in another one, and that is support your local shelters. They're just doing amazing work there on the front lines. They need your help and support. How hard is it to turn people away? Think about it for a moment. Um, you are um, on the phone with a woman who needs your help. Uh, she really wants to get in and you don't have any space for her feel like what that might be like for that staff person and the toll that takes on that individual um, to try to either find a space or to say, well, well, we really don't have anything for you. Um, we're not sure if we can find anything for you at this moment. Let's see what we can do to safety plan a little bit, but it isn't easy. It's really tough. Do people usually come back after being turned away? Um, I think it depends on the woman. Some, I think, over the years have, um, uh, you know, they continue to call until they can get in, and it has made a difference in their lives. Um, others um, may be able to find other options, or they work with a shelter in outreach. We would love to do a study, actually, on women who have called and uh, find out really, um, you know, how you know how they progressed in their hearing healing journey after that call, so maybe someday we'll have the resources for that. I just, I'd add, you know, when women call, it's anonymous, it's confidential. Sometimes they don't even give their name out of, you know, the fear or where they are at the moment. And sometimes they can't, you can't call them back because it's not safe to do so. I think that might be all of our questions for today. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Okay, thank you.